Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Wednesday. I took part of the week off just to hang out with my daughter who's been in town from New Orleans, but we're back today. And there's a lack of trials to cover for me personally right now. The ones that I would like to cover aren't streaming. So I've been following the Menendez brothers case since it happened way back in the day. And I thought since resentencing is coming up next month, I thought maybe this would be a good time to go back and recap that very first trial that was televised. I'm going to do this the same way that I cover trials normally in an hour or less, just give you the best parts of testimony. I'm hoping to finish the whole trial before resentencing. It was lengthy, but I think we can definitely get there. Now, it may not be consecutive days that I do this. There could be something pop up that I need to cover in cases that we're following. And as you know, the second trial wasn't televised, but we do have this one. Before we jump in, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, and you can click that bell icon if you want notifications of when I post new content. My goal is to get to 100,000 listeners by the end of the year. I'm not sure I'll make that goal, but it's good to have a goal, right? Also, I've been working on a lot of new merch in the merch store. Go check it out. Everything is 10% off with code SHERLOCK10. I've done some Christmas shirts, a couple of lyrics shirts, and then just some pretty last shirts. I appreciate you guys. Things like that are how I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing. And a big thank you to everybody who's given super chats or donated. Appreciate y'all so much. Just a little recap, the Los Angeles District Attorney has recommended resentencing for the Menendez brothers. And in that press conference, he said there is a moral and an ethical obligation to review what is being presented to us and make a determination based on a resentencing side whether they deserve to be resentenced. Even though they were clearly the murderers because they have been in prison for years and they have paid back their dues to society. If there was evidence that was not presented to the court at the time, and had that evidence been presented, perhaps a jury would have come to a different conclusion. Two of the biggest things is, number one, former Menudo band member said that Jose Menendez abused him when he was a teenager. Also, the new evidence is that letter written by Eric to his cousin just a few months before the murders, which would have corroborated the cousin's testimony on the stand in that first trial. In addition, you have upwards of 30 family members, including the sister of Kitty Menendez, asking that the brothers be released. What do we know about the judge from this case? Well, Judge Weisberg was also the presiding judge for the Rodney King case where the police officers were acquitted and that verdict led to the L.A. riots. And not too long before the second trial started, OJ was acquitted. So there was a lot going on in LA at the time the boys went to the second trial, which ultimately ended in a conviction and life without parole. In the first trial, the molestation claims were allowed in, and it was the defense for the brothers and also the motive for the murders. But in that second trial, the judge did not allow any expert testimony for what he called the abuse excuse. The LA Times reported at that time that the judge said he was not convinced there were legal grounds in California to allow experts to testify that Eric and Lyle were battered children. I can't imagine that kind of a ruling today in 2024. It is the reason they say they committed the murders, but didn't come in that second trial like it did in the first. He also allowed that first trial to be televised, but not the second. So we're going to cover the openings for Eric Menendez today. And Prosecutor Kuriyama was the one who delivered those. For the state, evidence will show Eric and Lyle conspired to kill their parents, Jose and Kitty. Eric called it the perfect murder. August 18th, 1989, they drove to San Diego and bought two Mossberg 12-gauge shotguns using false identification. They committed the murders on August 20th, 1989, Sunday night, when the maid was not there, and they had an alibi. Eric told police they went to see Batman and then to Santa Monica to a taste of L.A., which it's a wine-tasting function. 
Eric said they came home to pick up fake IDs when they came upon the brutal slayings of their parents. They called 911 and reported the killings. Jose had a gunshot wound to the back of his head and four others. Kitty had 10, including a wound to her left cheek. August 24th, 1989. Eric and Lyle went to a jeweler's in Beverly Hills and purchased Rolex watches and money clips for $15,000. September 8, 1989, the brothers collected $200,000 each and $125,000 on September 15, 1989, in insurance proceeds from Jose's policy. Eric tried to pin the crimes on others. November 29, 1989, two months after the murders, Eric was secretly recorded in a conversation he had with Craig Signorelli at Gladstone's restaurant in Malibu. He was heard saying, I've known from the beginning. No clues, no one heard anything. He then says he thinks Castro may have been involved in the murders and says we are talking about special hitmen, special shotguns, and knew what they were doing in and out of the house. No one saw or heard anything. We're talking about serious hitmen. They nearly got away with their crimes. They meticulously picked up all the shotgun shells from the family room, buried the shotgun, and they had an alibi. Seven months into the investigation, the Beverly Hills Police Department got a break in the case, which led to a search warrant on the home and office of Beverly Hills psychologist Jerome Ozeal. And this evidence resulted in their arrests. Lyle, on March 8, 1990, and Eric on March 11, 1990. Dr. Ozeal will testify on Halloween 1989, Eric said he was having vivid dreams of his parents being murdered and told the doctor, we did it. When the doctor asked if he meant he and Lyle murdered his parents, Eric responded yes, and said his father was too controlling, made them feel inadequate, criticized them, and prevented them from doing what they wanted to do. He said he and Lyle discussed killing their father and getting him out of their lives. Eric said that his mother had to be killed also because she would be a witness and she would have been miserable and at risk of self-harm without Jose. Eric said he and Lyle surprised their parents walking into the room with their pump shotguns. Eric said his dad cried out no, and the brothers began shooting. After they emptied their shotguns, Jose was dead, but Eric said their mother was not. She was moaning on the floor and trying to crawl away. Eric said they went back to the car and reloaded, then Lyle returned to kill their mother. They picked up the shotgun shell casings, removed their clothing, and put them in a bag. They drove to a garbage dumpster and threw away the bloody clothes. They buried the weapons down an embankment off Mulholland Drive. Then they went to a wine tasting event with Perry Berman, but Mr. Berman was not there, and they made plans to meet him later that night. They returned to their house and called 911 as if they had just come upon the scene. Eric said his father had recently nearly disinherited him, and he told Dr. Ozeal that was another reason to get rid of his father. Eric said there was no way to link them to the crimes since they lived in the home and their fingerprints would be there. And also, there were no witnesses and no one could link them to the weapons bought in San Diego in his mind. Eric said they felt they could never equal their father's accomplishments. Eric said he discussed with Lyle that their mother didn't deserve to die, but their plan was perfect and they didn't want to change it. The evidence will show that Eric is guilty of premeditated and deliberate murder. We move on to the defense openings, Leslie Abramson. She said openings are an outline, and if this were closings, she would oppose what the prosecutor just said, but this isn't closings. I'm going to tell you what evidence we plan to put on, which we intend to prove later. Eric has entered a plea of not guilty. And it's your job to decide what kind of killing this is and what you come to believe was the reason for the act. The only question in this case is why did these killings occur? There's no issue as to who killed Kitty and Jose.
why they were killed is what the focus of all of our evidence will be on. We intend to provide you with the answer to that question. Here's what many witnesses, including Eric, will testify to. On Sunday, August 20th, 1989, Eric was 18 and 21-year-old Lyle shot and killed their parents in their home on Elm Drive in Beverly Hills at approximately 10 p.m. with shotguns they bought in San Diego two days before. Eric signed the paperwork and they used the driver's license of a young man named Donovan Goudreau, a former friend of Lyle. Eric had been carrying Donovan's license for some time because he lost his own license and because Donovan was 21, which allowed Eric to enter places he normally would not be able to due to being underage. Having fired two shotguns in the middle of a quiet residential area on a quiet night, they expected an immediate police response. They waited. Nobody came. So they decided to leave and pretend they hadn't been home at the time of the shooting. For the next hour, they engaged in a frantic and feeble effort to construct an alibi. They went to a nearby movie theater, hoping to get tickets for a showing in progress. They discarded the guns and the shells. Eric discarded clothing he wore. They tried to meet a friend in Santa Monica, but he was home. At this time, Eric was incapable of functioning and was falling apart. They went home and Lyle called police. When police arrived, they noticed Eric was hysterical and the prosecution will say he's faking. But police and his tennis coach will say he wasn't. An officer will testify Eric was traumatized. He was 18 and had endured a lifetime of abuse. He was in shock and didn't want to go to jail. Over the next weeks and months, Eric was torn by guilt, remorse, and horror over what he had done, and his distress was visible to many witnesses. His family in New Jersey sent him to see a doctor. He lost a lot of weight. He was suffering constant nightmares, repeatedly reliving the killings. He told police months later that he could still smell the smoke, and although he had done the act, he was still traumatized by it and couldn't live with his guilty conscience. You'll hear expert testimony that this is not the post-crime mental state of a cold-blooded, calculated killer. As further proof of his lack of calculation, he confessed within weeks. First, to Craig Signorelli, a prosecution witness, and later, finding himself close to self-harm, he confessed to Jerome Ozeal. He didn't tell Craig or Jerome the whole story for many reasons we will explain to you. Not for lack of trust, but he didn't tell the true motivations for the killings. To do that, he would have to reveal shameful secrets he spent most of his life concealing. But what he couldn't do with them, he will do with you. Tell you why he killed his parents, the entire painful, complicated and difficult story of his life. On March 8th, 1989, Lyle was arrested in Beverly Hills and Eric was in Israel on a professional tennis tour. When he heard of his brother's arrest, he knew the police wanted to arrest him as well. He got on an airplane voluntarily and flew from London to Florida, Florida to Los Angeles. He was not in police custody. He came back knowing that in doing so, he was facing the gas chamber. Witnesses will tell of their observations of Eric and his family over the years to give a complete of a picture as possible of the treatment and lifetime abuse they received at the hands of their parents. People who knew them. Also, the evaluations, the profiling of our expert witnesses in the field of battered children and battering parents their family members, teachers, coaches, friends of the parents, friends of the sons, business associates of Jose, therapists who treated Kitty, and Eric himself will paint a portrait of Jose and Kitty, which will help you understand how they could have died at the hands of their children. What did they do to their children to bring this about? The professionals are some of the most credentialed in the areas of research of child abuse 
and the evaluation and treatment of abused children, some of which have never testified for the defense in a case before. They're mostly prosecution witnesses. They'll tell you the effects of maltreatment on a child and how that continues into adolescence and early adulthood. And most importantly, how the child shaped by abuse can be expected to react to threatening situations from the abuser, which happens to the personality structures of a child who doesn't get the basic things we all know children need. The damage is bad when those children receive harmful and traumatic experiences at the hands of the people who were supposed to be nice to them, and how the personalities and perceptions of abused children fall into predictable patterns. They'll share the over 40 hours of exhaustive evaluations which were conducted for over more than 40 hours of interviewing him. One expert has spent more than 200 hours with him and their opinion is that he is a young man who has suffered from extreme forms of lifelong sexual, emotional, and physical abuse at the hands of both his parents. It's not only their opinions, but also supported by an extensive battery of objective psychological testing that was administered to Eric by an experienced forensic psychologist. The experts examined school and medical records, read thousands of pages of witness interviews. They examined the same crime scene evidence that will be presented to you by the state. So what drove Eric and how did these events lead to homicide? The simple answer is for 12 years between the ages of six and 19, Eric was molested by his father, which started out as inappropriate touching and escalated in a carefully calculated pattern of grooming for his father's gratification. This included orally, sodomy, sexual assault, and the use of foreign objects. This was part of a more pervasive characteristic of Jose, his need to control and manipulate people around him. People will tell you he enjoyed exerting his power over those weaker than himself. And some of these people who will testify about this loved him in life and love him now. He was strong, arrogant, and has been described as knowing no boundaries. Others saw what kept his children in fear. Jose believed he was a superior being and indoctrinated his children into believing he was perfect, their family and way of life was superior to others, and being rich was all that mattered. He got total obedience from his sons. Our experts will tell you that as a perpetrator of incest, Jose was true to his aggressive, competitive, and fundamentally violent nature. She goes on to detail some of the abuse in very specific ways. I'm not going to go into the specific allegations on here. I will link openings in the description if you care to go watch for yourself, though. She goes on to say that Jose would keep instilling fear by putting Eric in frightening situations by coaching him in brutal methods in sports that resulted in him passing out on the tennis court, nearly drowning in the swimming pool, and the added pain of sexual assault. His excuse was that his son was not showing himself to be a Menendez. He showed himself as a weakling in the doctor's office by crying when he got a shot. So, Jose was going to make his son impervious to pain. He used needles, tacks, knotted ropes, and these episodes are what Eric calls the dark days. Eric and the experts will tell you these dark days taught him many lessons, how not to feel physical pain, not think about terrible things as they're happening, how to hate yourself, and feel like a coward and never trust an adult, especially one who was supposed to protect you. The crimes of incest happened in total secrecy. There were no police called, no photos taken, there was no crime scene. No one took Eric as a child to vindicate his repeated victimization. You will see those photos of Eric's bedroom in the house on Elm Drive. These crimes did not stop in the boy's early adolescence. It continued right up until the week before the homicides, right there in that bedroom on Elm Drive. What about his mother while these violations by dad are occurring for years? 
Three years before she died, she admitted to the son, everyone said adored her, that she knew of his father's molesting him. And for years, Eric suspected but refused to believe his mom knew. He loved her and wanted her to love him. The evidence of such feelings on her part towards him were very slim at best. He needed to believe that however much his father hated him, his mother must love him in her own way. He couldn't tell her what was going on for many reasons. In the early days of the seduction of his son, which our experts will tell you is a classic pattern among incestuous males, he told Eric this was their special secret. His father was critical of him and compared him to Lyle unfavorably. But Eric wanted his father's love and believed these acts were affection, which he would risk losing by disobeying dad's command of secrecy. Later, when it got violent, Eric felt he was the one that had done something wrong. He blamed himself for what he saw as a loss of his dad's affection and had nothing to complain about. Witnesses will tell you Kitty seemed angry at Eric and Lyle all the time. Uncontrollable rages over meaningless things. She never acknowledged he was sick, and he was punished for staying home from school by locking him in a closet as she ran errands. She criticized him nonstop for poor schoolwork, called him stupid and a dummy, and would lock him in the same closet if she thought he wasn't working hard enough on his homework. But she acted like she was afraid of Jose, and he treated her with disrespect both inside the home and in front of other people. Even though she was harsh with him, Eric believed his mom was a victim of Jose too, and he was protective of her. He didn't want to bother her with the molestation, even when he was throwing up after or was in pain or bleeding. He didn't want to break up their family, and he assumed she would believe him, not blame him, and do something about it. He had been told since an early age that his family was the center of the universe and was involved with his parents in every aspect of his life. But part of him was afraid she wouldn't care and wouldn't help if she did find out, so he didn't tell her. Did she know, though? You'll have to weigh the evidence. Eric said she admitted she did just before her death, 12 years of this in her own home as frequently as twice a month. You'll have to ask why did she never go in her son's room when Jose was alone with him? At this point in openings, the defense attorney asks, why did Kitty never enter the bathroom when Eric was throwing up after an episode with his dad? The state objected to this twice, the judge told the defense attorney this was her comments and to get back to evidence rather than her comment on the evidence. She says to the judge, this is not my comments. But she rephrases, you'll hear evidence that she never attended to her son when he was throwing up in the bathroom next door to her room after an episode with his father. But if he was sick from an illness, she would come and then complain about the mess. You'll hear evidence she never asked why Eric was crying after dad left his room, but taught him to put water in his eyes to erase the signs of his tears. You'll hear that up to the age of 15, Kitty would check her son's genitals in what she called checking you out. And she was in counseling. Sick and embarrassing secrets? Her therapist believed those were sexually related. Witnesses will tell you Kitty was obsessed with status and her social position. She enforced a daily pressure cooker training program for her boys. Friends of the brothers described the Menendez home as boot camp. People describe her as cold and distant. Some say hostile towards her children, and you'll hear that she was an extremely secretive and private person. But Kitty was close to Jose's sister, Terry, but... She lied to her on a regular basis, telling her the boys were superior students. But Eric was barely average. Kitty hid from everyone. Eric had learning disabilities and had trouble understanding verbal instructions. The school pointed it out, but she never gave him treatment. The school he attended for grammar and junior high did sign him up for after-school help for children with disabilities, 
but Kitty made sure he never attended. Her children had to be seen as perfect for her to be seen as superior, like her husband. And she sacrificed her son's needs for that. And in spite of the fact Kitty talked to Terry every day, Terry never knew of any learning problems or any trouble in the family. But Terry knew Kitty was competitive. Her desire to raise winners and that you ignored your kids' fears to make them tough. She rarely, if ever, showed affection to Eric. When he was out of babyhood, Kitty made sure he trained and competed in all the competitive level athletics that her and Jose pushed the boys into. Swimming at three, soccer at six, tennis at 11. She was critical of bad performances and the schedule they had for Eric left him no time to study. And with the learning disabilities, that made schoolwork hard, yet she still demanded he make good grades. It was the only measure of success, but it didn't seem to matter if he actually learned. A relative will testify that Jose's credo for success was to lie, cheat, and steal. Winning was all that mattered to him, too. Kitty encouraged her boys to cheat if it meant winning, and she did most of their schoolwork herself. The teachers knew, but they were intimidated by Kitty and Jose. They knew there was trouble in the family, but never stood up to them. Eric did the best he could for years because he knew no adults would rescue him. He worked hard to win trophies for his parents, but struggled with thoughts of self-harm, shame, and death. Eric's life improved because he became friends with Lyle, who he idolized. Even though Jose encouraged them to compete against each other and to never trust the other. Experts will tell you Jose ran his house in a divide-and-conquer style, none having an ally in the other, and his approval was the only one worth gaining. Lyle was a typical big brother. He was a bully to Eric when they were small, but in the teen years, Lyle started to defend him in small ways. Eric had few friends and fewer confidants. Lyle became the one person he felt safe to love. At the age of 15, Eric had two wishes. One, the abuse would stop. And two, one day he would go to college and dad wouldn't be able to come into his room anymore. In the summer of 1986, not long after they purchased a home in Princeton, New Jersey, Jose said he took a job in California. Eric was happy to leave and during the first six months in California, it looked like his prayers were answered because the abuse stopped. But there was trouble between his parents and Kitty was falling apart. Eric overheard that his dad had been having an affair for eight years and the shock and suffering consumed his mother. Lyle stayed in New Jersey to go to school, so Eric was left alone with his mom who stayed in her bedroom and cried for weeks. She did start therapy and kept going until she died, but she never got over Jose's affair. She never got better, and she never got close to dealing with the problems of her family. Kitty pressured 16-year-old Eric to get a girlfriend and set him a six-month deadline. He was scared if he got close to a girl, she would figure out what was happening with his dad. But he got a girlfriend, and you may see her here. He was devoted, but full of doubts about himself as a male. He still thought the abuse was partially his fault. His high school friends from about three years before the homicides will testify what he was like. As a high school tennis star, he was admired and made friends with other tennis players. He was fun, but also unusually anxious. He seemed preoccupied. His tutors say he would space out and they couldn't reel him back in. He was secretive and they noticed he lied to his parents about insignificant things. The experts will testify when a child's life has been built around secrets and concealing those secrets and parents who have intruded into every aspect of his life. For the last year before the homicides, his parents have been tapping into his phone. He found out after they died when he found the tapes. A security guard at the Elm House helped him find the recording device. 
just before the homicides, he will tell you he genuinely believed his mother had superpowers. She knew all these things he was concealing from her. He had no clue she was tapping his phone. Spring of 1989, Jose was displeased with Eric, who he thought was being rebellious, refusing to report hourly details of tennis practice or what part of his game he worked on. Jose's abuse at this point in Eric's life was a show of force and dominance and nothing else. Eric was going to attend UCLA, but his father said he would be required to sleep at home several days a week so that his parents could monitor his schoolwork. To Eric, he knew this meant the abuse would continue. Eric made efforts to leave the home, but Jose said they would always find him. There was no escaping them, and he would never survive on his own. Jose left on a business trip the week of August 15, 1989. Kitty and Lyle got into an argument, and she ripped off his hairpiece. Eric didn't know Lyle had lost that much hair, and it was clear Everyone in this family kept secrets. Eric told Lyle what his father had been doing and will tell you the details of that conversation. Lyle decided to come to the aid of his brother. He was going to demand Jose stop the abuse and allow them to leave the home and live together. He was terrified of what would happen when Jose found out Eric had told Lyle about the abuse, but he had confidence in his brother and wanted to believe Lyle could help him. When Jose returned from his trip, he met with his older son, and it was a disaster. Jose was defiant. He is my son, and I will do what I want with him. Although most molesters deny it, when they admit it, they justify the behavior. Our experts will say that Jose's personality and character structure fit his behavior pattern. Jose's reaction of Lyle's threat to go public if Jose didn't stop. There were violent and hysterical confrontations between first his dad and then with his mother. Jose again threatened to kill him, and Kitty had acknowledged her complicity in the abuse all along. She blamed the boys for what she saw as her greater victimization. I hate you. I wish you had never been born. And it wasn't the first time she said this to her boys. The next day, a Friday, Convinced their parents were going to kill them rather than allow them to go public with the facts of the molestation, Eric and Lyle purchased shotguns for their own protection. They wanted to buy handguns, which would be more useful for self-defense, but being amateurs with firearms, they found out you could not buy handguns on demand. They didn't think they'd be alive in two days, let alone two weeks. Eric will tell you what the next two days were like increasing terror, lack of sleep, and the words and actions of both parents that convinced him that their plan to eliminate their sons was in place. And on Sunday night, it appeared to him the trap was sprung by words and deeds. He perceived his parents were about to kill him, and he replied in pure panic. He fired every round of his gun into them. One expert who works on analyzing crime scene evidence will describe this crime scene as the overkill one sees when frightened and powerless people kill those who they fear and see as all-powerful. The crime scene of abused children who killed out of fear. The defense is relying heavily on the testimony of Jerome Ozeal. He wasn't there when the killings occurred, so he can know no more than what he was told. And he was not told the truth about why these killings took place. She goes on to say that Jerome Ozeal can lie, and they will challenge the truthfulness of his testimony. She says, we will present evidence to prove this man operates on his own agenda, has motive to lie about what he was told by the Menendez brothers, and he has a track record of lying, manipulating, and controlling people for his own selfish purposes. Eric was the abused son of wealthy parents. He had to kill them because he could no longer endure their abuse and had to stop it. His instinct to survive took over. The prosecution says they did it for the money. But what do you say when poor kids kill? The judge 
interrupts and says, now you're arguing again, but she was finished and sits down. So on the next episode, we'll go through the openings for Lyle, and then we'll start getting into the best of witness testimony. It's not going to be verbatim. It's going to be really picking out the most important parts of the main testimony. When we get to the part where Eric and Lyle take the stand, we will definitely dive into that pretty deeply. But that's it for today. If you know anybody who might be interested in kind of reliving this first trial and seeing what transpired throughout the course of the trial for Eric and Lyle, send them the link, share it on social media. In the meantime, hope you guys have a good rest of your afternoon and we will see you soon.